we're um, we're um, in the this will be the last class for the evangelism uh, class series that we've done. Um, I think we've had about fifteen classes or so on it, uh, fifteen or sixteen. So um, I'm I'm I've it certainly enjoyed it, and I hope that you have too. And more than that, I hope that you have learned something from it. And I hope that it's been something that. Uh, has been uh, good for you that you've learned because this is something that we're commanded to do. It's something we're commanded to be and something we should want to do. Um, and so I hope that we have you know, trained ourselves to make ourselves more likely to do this as well as have more of a craft to do it as well. So um, there, I, I want to do a review, but um, I'll, I want to kind of save that to the, last, the end. And we'll just see how much time we have left. Um, but bef- uh, and these are the different um, main uh, sections that we kind of went through um, in this in this class. Uh, and so, if you understand this about evangelism, I'll, I'll take it as a success. So, uh, we we talked about the lack of evangelism today. Again, we'll get through all this. We'll do a review over this, but just to kind of give you maybe thinking through things. We talked about the lack of evangelism. What are some reasons for that? We looked at developing a heart like Jesus. We have to care. Uh, We talked about praying for God's help, how we need to work with God. We talked about everyone has to do their part. This is a church collective effort. It's not just relegated to uh, one or a few people. And then finally, the process of helping someone to become a disciple. What does that process look like? Uh, for them. Uh, and so we look through the, those type of things. We'll kind of go through a little bit more. I'll have a few questions on some things that we kind of went through. Uh, but I just kind of want to open it up to question and response. So I want to give you a chance. Uh, we didn't cover everything. This is an exhaustive cl- uh, class on evangelism. I think it would take a lot longer to, to do such a thing. Uh, there's several things that I cut out of it. Um, just because you can't get into every nitty-gritty detail. But that, that said, I hope that I gave general principles and you're able to go off of those. But if you, there was something specific that you wanted to, uh, you had questions about or that you're struggling to work through or something that uh, you felt like would be very important to discuss um, that, that we hadn't or was inf- inf- uh, insufficiently discussed, um, I'll open that up. So... Um, and if not, then we'll just do a review, and I'll take questions however they go. So uh, does anyone have any questions um, that they would uh, like to, to share? Uh, I don't promise to answer, but I promise some kind of response. So uh, Tracy? Can you go to the last slide? I, was, I missed the last thing on there. Was it how, how to, after everyone has to do their part? This, okay. this one? Yeah, yeah. Jacob? Okay. Okay. I, I will throw this to everyone because I think this is be a good question for everyone. So where the, the opportunities that you've had to, um, in some small way or in some great way, um, discuss the gospel with someone, teach someone the gospel, where have those opportunities developed? Work. Work. Yes. We, I mean, uh, unless you're retired, I know we have a lot of retirees here. That's where you spend probably the majority of your week, other than your bed. So, um, it's, for many people, even more than your, your bed. So, um, yeah, work is probably the place where you'll bump into people the most. Yes, Bob. Neighbors. Neighbors are excellent. When, like, I, this is something that I feel like we should have done better. Part of it was we moved here during COVID, and so it just, like, uh, and then we never actually got it. But that's, that's totally on us. We never really... Um, made those 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 uh, that effort that we need to, but we're trying to do a little bit better. But uh, uh, you need to make a, a, tr- a concentrated effort to get to know your neighbors and, and try to go past just you know saying hi. That's a good first step, but like get to know them and then maybe have discussions with them and then get to know what they like and then maybe even have them over and those kinds of things. Try to make a conservative effort to get to know your neighbors. And when someone is moving in, that that's like a bullseye that you should you should want to be the first people to welcome them to the neighborhood. Uh, because oftentimes they will have 
Um, they, they have a greater chance to have not as much, not as many friends. They'll have low religious investment that we talked about. They won't have a already established church if they're not from the area, all those kinds of things. And you could be the first one to introduce them. Good. What else? What other places? Yeah, you do. Yeah, she good, was, good. She was very wanting much to learn. Excellent, good. Uh, the gym right now, the physical therapist. Yeah, physical therapist, yeah, good, excellent. You get to spend time with them while you're doing the exercise, you get to talk, excellent. What else? Hairdressers. Hairdressers, excellent. That's another great one. I was going to say the bus stop. Bus stop, yeah. When you're waiting for the bus to come or, you know, your hairdresser join as you're getting your hair cut. I know somebody who, who intentionally went to a different hairdresser every single time she got her cut, just so she had the opportunity to preach the gospel. And sometimes it was not to her physical advantage of appearance. <laughs> but, like, you know, she got a lot of classes that way. Uh, she was a remarkable, remarkable woman. So, yeah, good. What else? Your friends. And I add family that are Christians. Family's a little bit harder usually to evangelize to, uh, but uh, usually because they've kind of entrenched themselves. Um, but you should still, if you haven't like made them know that you're a Christian or the gospel or live in the hope and be an example, you should be able to do those things. Good. What else? It should be, like, everywhere, honestly. <laughs> like, you named some really good ones, but coffee shops, um, that's one that I've gotten a lot of um, discussions with. Either people pass it by, seeing me uh, studying my Bible, or I get to know the baristas, we strike up conversation. Anywhere in which you, you consistently go, I know some, some of you here have went to restaurants, you frequent restaurants, and so you know the waitress or, uh, waitresses, or waiters, and so you develop a relationship with that. Literally, like, this is part of the conscious thing. Like, everywhere you go, you should be looking for opportunities to grow a relationship, to get to know someone, to be a light so you can introduce the gospel to someone else. So, yes, very, very good question. That's really good to think about that because we can just go through life with our head down, and we can be just like the disciples. Okay, I'm here to get food. And that's all we think about instead of changing um, a whole town's life, uh, spiritual life. Good. What other questions? Okay, go ahead. Um, I was just talking with a friend of mine, and she's Catholic. And she said that she was going to go to Catholic school, but she didn't want to And I think that's pretty typical of most Christians in the United States is because it has been seen uh, as a bad thing, uh, impolite thing, um, if you try to bring up religion or, quote, unquote, push your religion on so someone else. Uh, when, in fact, it's the best thing that you can do. You're trying to save their school, soul, and, and it will vastly, I believe, improve their life in a lot of ways. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's difficult. Tracy? I had, I had two questions, and the, the first one might be the easier one. Let's start with that one. <laughs> um, there was a class I was absent. The, the, the homework was to look in the Bible for conversion stories. Yes. And I missed that in the next class with the answers. But I know um, that it was a Saul converting to Paul, and then the, the eunuch. Um, who was he talking to? Who was in the story with him? Like the eunuch? Yeah. The Philip? Philip. Yeah. You. 
And then what are um, some other examples? So in that class, we, I ran out of time, surprise. Um, and so we never got to that, that part um, necessarily uh, of actually bringing up um, conversion st stories, but I, I mean, a bunch of them are in Acts um, that you can, you can, and, and it's, and there's a lot of individual ones, so there's Philippian Jailer, there's, uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, the um, Lydia, Woman at the Well, yeah, I'll take that, yeah, yeah, definitely, that's a conversion story, there's Zacchaeus, like, there's so many, and then there's also greater ones, so like when Tabitha, also called Dorcas, is raised from the dead. It says that many people believed in, in Jesus, and there's, there's a bunch. I, and I, I can't remember exactly uh, why I, 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 I said that. I think I was wanting to look for the pattern. I forgot what the class, was it the? It was after you gave the steps of conversion. Yeah, so I, I wanted to, to think about what was it that was said that you know, kind of, was it something that was um, intellectually, where, where did they start kind of thing? Where did, where did the person start with them? And, and, and we're not told always what they were taught. And usually, you know, it's the gospel you can be assumed. But um, I'm thinking with um, like Paul and the Arabagus, it just starts with, there's this God that, you know, you have this unknown God. I know who he is, and he starts there. With the Jews, you start with, you know, uh, that there you already think that there's a God, and they, they agree that the Old Testament is the word of God. So Peter, when he talks to the Jews and the, the day of Pentecost, he starts from there, and he goes to the Old Testament, and he goes to Joel, and he goes to the Psalms, and he goes to David's life, and, and he points that, that, that it, thus, they, you know, Jesus is the Savior, they are the sinners, Jesus is the Savior that they need, and devote your life to him by being uh, baptized and wash away your sins, so uh, those kind of things. Yeah, and it's convicting. It's convicting um, the person that I am a sinner. Like I, I am a sinner. I'm not just a generally good Jewish person that you know keeps the laws as many people would think. I, I am a sinner, um, and you have to you have to have that that conviction about yourself in order to seek a savior. Um, so yeah, good. Um, any any other thoughts on that on that question or anything? Um, did you want to go do your second one? The second one, it's not, it's not a hard question. I just, I guess I'm, I, I'm curious to know what other people's opinions are because I have some answers too, but I just wanted to compare notes. Um, a while back you talked about, uh, towards the end of a class you said, da 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 for the church to be growing. And I thought to myself, well, what is the thing slash are the things that to determine a church is growing? So, like, how do you determine if yeah. a church is growing, okay, gotcha. Um, sure, I'll, 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 I'll yeah, yeah, like, I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, same, so I'll go for it. So, I say the answer to that question that requires the least brain power is there are more people than it. Okay, so one way you Honestly, could, I know that's, those are the yeah, for, yeah, you know, there, there's some better answers than that, like, yeah. Yeah, I, I think those are all all markers. I will say, like all those things are not necessarily. Um, if you see those, it doesn't always necessarily mean the church is growing or not growing. So the it, it's church. Uh, um, the markers of a church growing are very tricky because you can have a bad church who grows rapidly. And we, we see this, you know, all, all the way around for various reasons. You know, if you basically exclude no one, you're going to grow. If you give out, you know, free money, you're going to grow. Like, there's ways you can grow in a not healthy way. Um, but, yeah, uh, but, but generally, those are some good markers to have. And it's kind of like if there's, 
if you have enough of them, you kind of show that you, you're growing. Kathy, did I see your hand? Yes. And one of the markers of health is how well we take care of each other. Absolutely. I 100% agree. Good. Okay. So would you say that having marriage in a church, is that a sign of a growing church? Having marriage? Marriage, like two people who meet and they come together and they, they, they get married. Um, probably not one of the best ones. Okay. So would you say um, having babies from those people who are in church, does that, does that count too? I'm going somewhere with yeah, I, I, again, I wouldn't say that's one of the best ones, but, like, again, I, I, I don't think, I think it's probably, I mean, those are good things to do, and, like, if it's a good thing to, you know, kind of generally do, that's, you know, can kind of coincide with it, but I wouldn't consider that one of the best ones. Is it the number of baptisms that occur in a year, in a month, in a week, what, that's the rest of it? Right. What are the things that determine, does it count as marriage and church? Or the babies that, right. that people are having, or is it the number of baptisms? Each all of the above. Well, it's a spiritual. And also none of the above, like <laughs> because like you can have you can have so you can have a church that has no baptisms, but in a given year, but they're very evangelistic because we can't control the other people to be converted. Like that's not something that we can control. Um, however. If there's a church that is not baptizing for, and, keep, and if they do baptize, they're not keeping the person that was baptized for years and years and years, that's evidence that there is something wrong. So I, I wouldn't say, like, um, again, that's why tr there's been bajillion church uh, books on church growth. It's because it's such a hard thing to define. If, if it's there. Healthy is a, is a really good thing. If the, the church is healthy, that is like a, a, a sub indicator that it's growing. But again, like what is a healthy church? And then we can name a whole bunch of things. But it's hard quant to quantify it. It just is. And that's why it just, it's just hard. And that's, it's hard for preachers too, because you don't necessarily see your efforts in quantifiable kind of ways. Like I teach, and then it seems like nothing's happening. I teach and teach and teach. But it's one of those things maybe if you look back, you know, at the end of the year, and a couple of years, you kind of see some, some growth in different ways. I think some of the best ways that you can measure church um, um, growth and health is, one, are people growing and mature? Are people going up like the dis disciple ladder, as it were? Are they um, going from, you know, sitting and really consuming a lot of information, teaching and stuff like that, and then they go to being a co-teacher, you know, inviting some people, and then they go to a place where they teach, you know, the young kids, and then they go in into a place where they can, you know, teach adults, or, you know, they're, they're growing, or whatever kind of uh, section is their, their, their life. There's a continual growth of the whole church. And then also, is there new people coming in? Um, now, again, I think that's not, you can't just uh, quantifiable, uh, that can't be the end all be all, but also if you're not growing uh, with new people coming in, uh, new non-Christians that are becoming Christians, I think that shows something. Um, and if you're not keeping those people, you're not reaching out, making relationships, making them strong, and they those people leave and just fall off, that also shows something. Um, and then also all the markers of, uh, like Kathy said, of, of church health. If there's always fighting and contention and all those kinds of things, you're going to lose people and not be a growing church either. So a lot of different things. Uh, Daryl, did you have your hand up? Go ahead. The, um, one of the Right. We do things and we expect results. But God gives the increase. Right. It's, it's, it's kind of like, okay, if we don't do those things, there's not going to be increase. Yeah. But if we do, there may not be. Right. So it's kind of like, okay, where's the chicken and the egg? Yeah. But at the same time, 
we still have, as we talked about this weekend, our love that says we're supposed to love as Christ loved. We are supposed to obey his commandments. We're supposed to be all of these things. Healthy. Yeah. And you think of a body, a person's body, as they grow over the years, different parts grow at different rates and have different yeah. results. And yeah. Bipedals Excellent. And all these things. But it's God that's giving the increase. If Absolutely. We, we have to keep in mind that what we do is not causing the increase, but we can hinder. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I think we got to remember that a congregation is a collective of individuals. And so for us to be growing and healthy as a collective means that we need to be growing and be healthy as individuals. And if that is occurring and we're each doing what we're supposed to be doing, we will see a collective growth and health as far. And because you'll see instances where, you know, you have two or three really good people who are trying to do um, God's word and evangelize and they will be the ones and they'll have a few baptisms and they will be, you know, trying to uh, evangelize and you'll, and, and it will feel like the church is healthy because, you know, only a couple of people are doing the work and it, you're growing in that kind of way. Or you kind of feel healthy because you have swelling, which is other Christians from other places are moving towards your area. And so the church feels full. But that does not necessarily mean that the church is healthy or growing. I, I think when each person in the congregation is doing what they should be doing and they're trying to mature and grow closer with God and trying to help other people and be better disciples and reach more and more lost people, everybody's doing that, you will have growth on a collective church uh, thing. So, Kyle? So, I like the idea of the church being a collection of individuals that you just said, um, and it, it really plays back to the parable of the soils. And you know, yes. The soils that there are. And ultimately, the way that you can tell if something is good soil isn't if there's growth there. It could be thorns, it could be choked out, it could be shallow foundation. Uh, but it's, it's whether or not it bears fruit. Yes. Um, and I think that's kind of what we've been talking about is if, if this group is growing and they're healthy, they're going to be producing fruit. But just because something's growing in size or number doesn't mean that it is necessarily healthy. Like my, my banana tree in my backyard hasn't produced fruit in like two years. Right. So I'm ready to cut that thing down. <laughs> uh, and it's growing. Right. Yeah. And that's. I think that's kind of the, the marker that. Um, I mean, it's it's a bit of an extrapolation from Jesus' parable. I, I think it's yeah. pretty accurate, accurate. Absolutely. Yeah, I think so. We have to be produce of fruit. If you, I mean, he's pretty clear, and he says that in Matthew seven too, that any fruit, any tree that doesn't bear fruit, I will, my father will cut down. So like, uh, that's. I mean, like we have to be producing fruit in our lives. That should be the goal. Um, so, good. Question. Any, any other thoughts on that particular question? One other thing that something Cherry said made me think of this, and that is that sometimes we produce fruit, but it doesn't show as a miracle in the local congregation because Absolutely. it may be somebody that's moving away. Yep. Yep. And it may produce a lot of fruit yep. down the line. So it's, yep. it, it's hard, like you say, it's hard to sometimes quantify. Yep. Don't do I've, I've had. Um, I've had uh, almost more opportunities with people that will never be able to attend here than I have had with people that would attend here just since I've been here. And it's just kind of how it is. But, um, but I'm God's servant. I'm not O'Galley Church of Christ servant. I'm God's servant. And so anyone I can touch, anyone that you all can touch, even if they can't be members here, they can be members with us and our family in heaven, which is way more important. So, yeah, I, I think that's excellent. Very good. Any other thoughts on that question? Okay. Um, any other questions um, as far as evangelism? Anything that you've struggled with? Um, anything um, question that stumped you a particular situation? Yeah, oh. So, question that stumped me. I was witnessing to someone whose heart's here and they Right. 
Okay, yeah. And I know it's common, but maybe not know what to say to it. So I okay. Everything. Yeah. But uh, she brought it up today when we were just talking about witnessing and evangelizing. And like, that's still a question that I don't know how to answer. Okay, good. Um, so the first thing would be, do they believe in God? That's kind of my question. And so if the, usually if they don't believe in the afterlife, it's usually that they don't believe in God. Um, and so I, I kind of start there to some, to, to some extent. Um, and, and you kind of, there's a, um, a, um, a class I'll do with them from Ecclesiastes. I've done it once here, like two years ago, so doubt everyone remembers that one. Uh, but it is a very, um, it's based on Ecclesiastes, but it is a, just a logic with them. Like, what do you want out of life? Um, and I'll do it. So I plan on doing that in the next couple of weeks. Um, I may do it next week. We'll see. So if you're here for that. But it's basically, you know, why are we here? What's our purpose here? How did we get here? All of those questions. Um, and uh, I kind of go through the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter um, uh, 11 and 12. Um, and I go through those those chapters, and I just kind of say, you know, what what is the meaning and purpose of life? And I go to that that those passages. Um, I, I kind of don't want to delve into all of it because I think it'll take a lot of time, and I plan on doing that and it's very soon. Uh, but I kind of hit those things. Um, be like, okay, like what is the purpose of everything? What 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 may, will make you happy in life? Most people say money. I'd be like, and then I poke that and be like. Well, do you know, like, some of the richest people in the world are the most unhappiest? Um, and because, like, once you have, how, how much money do you have to have for you to be happy? Um, and I just kind of poke at the, the illusions, the deceptions that the devil pl- places in front of us uh, that think will give us happiness and purpose and meaning in life, but really don't. And that's kind of where I start, kind of thing. Because that's planting the seed. Yep. That may have effects ten years from now. Right. Yeah. And so, number one, do it. Number two, don't be disappointed because we don't see a result immediately. Absolutely. Yeah, and that, that's a big thing. Like, you're not going to get him to go from I don't believe in God to okay, you know, let me accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and let me like in, in one conversation. That's that's not going to happen. It's just not. Um, the further they are in those, those steps, the, the longer it usually takes them to get to the place where they say, I will surrender my life to Jesus. Uh, and so just, again, don't put too much effort or, or uh, sorry, don't put too much pressure on yourself that you have to reach certain goals or certain, uh, you know, convert them by the end of the week. Otherwise, you're a failure. No, your, your job is to sow the best you can with what you have. Um, and and um, try to pray for, to God to give you the wisdom to do such a thing, and pray that um, that God will give increase and open that person's heart. Um, up. So um, I may have a better answer for you in a couple of weeks, but hopefully that helps a little bit. Any other thoughts on that? I mean, and, and before I really tell them anything, I would just ask questions, too. Like, that's the best thing you can do in that situation. Because, um, like, there's many different belief systems that don't believe in an afterlife or necessarily God. Um, and so you just be like, okay, what do you believe in? How, how do you think we get here? Where, what, you know, why are we here? You know, those kinds of things. And if it's just as, like, you become word fluid, 
you're just supposed to live and try to get as much joy as you can out of it. You know, those kind of things, which is generally the answer that I'd go to. Well, that seems very depressing. <laughs> um, and go to asking purpose and those kinds of things. So. That's something I need to ask particular where the questions are because I, there's never been a point in my life where I did not believe in an afterlife. Like, you know, right. my faith ebbs and flows and becomes stronger and weaker, but ever since I can remember, I believe there's a life after this one. And so trying to wrap my head around empathizing with not believing that would take some work. Yeah. Interesting. But... I think if you grew up not believing in afterlife, it would take some work to believe in one. That there's something, you know, you know, magical that we can't see. Or, you know, that's kind of what they're thinking. So, it again, take a lot of curiosity on the part of the person who's quote unquote explaining it to them. Yes. Yeah. It, take, it takes patience. Uh, good. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, that all people are hope for something. Yeah. What's the expectation? You can just drop your head, do your thing, and drop out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and some people do. And I mean, I, I think the rise of depression and various mental illnesses, especially depression, is, is in part because of the lack of. Uh, Christianity, less and less Christianity. So the lack of hope of uh, future judgment in which, you know, every wrong will be made right and that you'll be with your Father in heaven forever. Like, if, if you don't have that hope and your life today really stinks, like, dude, like, your life is horrible then. Like, because, like, you, there is no afterlife and you have a terrible life here. So, yeah, what do you got? So... Yeah, it's it's so like that's what yeah you I I I think there's something better out there. So yeah, everyone does believe in something, and it and kind of the key in questions is understand what do they put as their something? Is it the self? Is it money? Is it the family? Is it their preeminence? What it, what what is it? Um, so yeah, good. Any other thoughts or any other questions? Kyle? Um, what is your favorite or go-to way to transition the topic to spiritual things? So say you're like talking to somebody about sports. How do you transition that topic? You can't be saying like, oh, did you catch the baseball game? Yeah. yeah. You know about God? What, what's, <laughs> what spiritual team do you root for? Like, uh, I don't know. Okay. And, and this isn't sports, but um, th this this is the only transition that I've used that has been relatively good, as far as I can tell. Is when I've had a, a, a manager or a coworker or a friend who's like giving me repeated compliments or, or or somehow laying praise on me at the point where you might say, "Thank you, thank you very much." I quote a Bible verse. I forget what she even was saying. I did particularly well, but like she, she said two or three sentences in a row of something that I did well, and I quoted Ecclesiastes nine ten, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, etc. No, or just like uh, giving praise to God, like saying you know, it's just through God's God's ability and God's um, uh, grace that I'm able to. Do that. I'm glad that this was good for you. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good way of doing it. Um, usually, I try to like the way that I do it the most is I try to talk about when they ask me questions. I try to work it in. So like, and what did you do this weekend? Well, we had um, a bunch of people over, and we were staying with Luke, and it was a great discussion on X, Y, and Z. That's kind of how I I do it because it is less defensive because I'm not asking them, I'm bringing it up in my life. Um, and I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to bait the hook a little bit. Like, I want them to ask, is what I want to happen. Um, that's what I, I, I want them to almost, you know, bring it up. Because if you, 
Because if it feels like you're, you know, digging into their spiritual life, a lot of people don't like to talk about that. But if you, like, bait the hook a little bit and you talk about how great a discussion is, they ask questions about it, or they're like, oh, what church do you go to? Which is a very common one. Um, an easy one for me is, like, what do you do? So that's easy for me to, like, to like put that in for, for that. But it also is a turnoff, too, uh, and in some ways. So... Um, and also, it's kind of harder for me to invite because it sounds like come to my church in which I preach at, who also pay me, you know, kind of like, so it's kind of a, a, because of the perception that we have, but um, I, that's what I try to do is work it into questions that they ask of me. Um, and then if they bring up something that's remotely spiritual, then I'll, I'll go with it and also ask them more questions about it. That's kind of how I do it. I don't have like any set line, I guess, I guess. It's just always looking for opportunities to share how great God has affected my life, which is the mindset that we need to get into to make that happen. I've often had people ask me questions, and I have them answered themselves. My son-in-law was a very captive organ. He lived with us the last year of FIT, and Don would go to work, and Michelle would go to work, and... Uh, <laughs> And uh, he took our son's room when he went in the Navy and left Todd and I home by ourselves a lot. And he will tell you, he said, he would ask me questions. And he told me, he said, I want you to know I'm practically an agnostic. Right. I said, okay, we'll go from there. I said, said, you want to continue to be one or you want to change? Well, how do I change? So I gave him scriptures. I put him at the dining room table, and I set the Bible in front of him. And I said, you look up all these scriptures. And I'm not answering any of your questions. You're going to answer them. I said, you look these scriptures up, read them, and then you tell me what they're telling you to do. And he did. And about two hours later, he said, I guess I'm not an agnostic anymore. (laughs) I said, well, we'll go from there. Yeah. And it's always good when asked questions to it's not I'm not the authority it's not me it's it's the bible it's God so good uh really really good questions I I would like to just do a brief review in the in the five minutes that we have or so left um this is this will be pretty quick but um so this is starting from the top we talked about how there's a lack of evangelism in churches today it means it does not mean that no one is evangelizing it just means that by and far most christians in really all denominations across the board do not um, evangelize um, like uh, they used to uh, in many instances uh, i talked about a survey that was done from one to ten and the average answer for um, what is the role of evangelism or how important do you view evangelism by your actions um, from a one to 10 scale and the average answer was a two. Um, I believe that's probably pretty standard uh, far and beyond. Um, And then we talked about why is that the case? Why can be evangelism be hard? And you remember the four C's that we talked about of why evangelism can be hard? Care. Courage, craft, conscience. So you're being conscious of the opportunity. So care, you care, you actually care. That's the, the base, the foundation for it. If you don't care, none of the, uh, nothing matters. Like if you just don't care, it doesn't matter. Um, then you have to be conscious of the opportunities that you have before you. You have to have courage to take those opportunities and then the craft to, um, to deliver on those opportunities. And those are the four mental things that kind of kind of stop us. Um, and so we need to have, to develop a heart like Jesus. Um, how do we care about the lost like Jesus? Well, think to Luke uh, 15. That's the, what uh, the three parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and lost sons. Um, and how the people in those stories cared about what was lost. They went to extreme effort. They had invested in what was lost. They were observant and willing to sacrifice to bring it back. Those are the things that we need to have, um, a a care for the lost like Jesus has a care for the lost. Um, And the role of prayer. Prayer is very important. If we don't have God on our side, nothing we do here will be uh, worth anything. 
we need to pray. And I hope that ever since that you've been continually praying for the lost and how we as a collective, as you as an individual, can be the people to introduce the lost uh, to, to Jesus and, and, and help them in, in their life. And I, I didn't put this in, in the, um, when we talked about prayer, but I, I, I forgot about it. But I think this one's a really cool. This is when he's talking, Ezekiel's talking about this new Israel that will come along. And he says, you know, there's going to be opportunity where I will let you ask me to increase your, your, your kingdom, your flock. So ask me. Ask me and I will increase it. And I, I think it's a really cool, um, cool place. Uh, for evangelism to succeed, everyone must do their part. Um, it is in, uh, impossible for evangelism to succeed in a church long term if only a few people are doing all the work. It has to be a collective. It has to be a collective. We all must be um, doing it. Ephesians 4 talks about that. Everyone must be doing their part. Um, and some of the things that are expected of every Christian, I believe, that the Bible says that we all must do is, one, be an example. Everywhere we go, everything we do, we must be in, in, an example. Uh, we must uh, do good everywhere we go. We must uh, be different in the way we, we talk, the way we care, the way we communicate with other people. We must stand out for good. We also must be able to explain the hope that is within us. There should be something uh, we should be able to at least say why we became a Christian and what, and what made us believe in the gospel. We should all be able to pray, pray for the lost, and then also make a friend. Uh, we've all made friends in our life. And you don't have to make 10 or 20 friends, just make one friend for, uh, and to have the opportunity of spreading the gospel because you'll be um, so much more successful trying to evangelize is someone that you've built a relationship than a complete stranger. Not saying you shouldn't take those opportunities, but you have a higher chance of success. And then there's some things that we have, some strengths that we have possess that can be used for evangelism. Um, it, we need encouragers. We need people that encourage one another. That and that that goes beyond just speaking encouraging words. That means actually doing some stuff. Uh, speaking is 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 nice, and saying good job is nice, but it doesn't last. You have to have the actions behind it that will help. Uh, we need connectors. We need people that connect when. People do become um, come into this building who are not Christians. When you uh, when uh, new Christians uh, come into their assembly, they need relationships. They need people to connect with. We should be swarming them, um, especially if you are, uh, have similar interests. You're around the same age group. It's it's on you to make those connections. Um, and, and, and help that person. We need people that will invite. We need people that will teach and co-teach. And we need people that are serving. Um, all these things are different strengths that we have. We all have these here. These, all the things that we can try to exceed at. Encouraging, connecting, inviting, teaching, co-teaching, and serving. Uh, and we really need to be thinking about how we can take the best every opportunity, but especially the opportunities that we have where people who are not Christians um, come into this assembly. It's literally got like God, you know, dumped them on a doorstep. Is like here, like I can't make it any easier for you. Um, and so we need to take advantage of of those people that that come here. Um, and helping someone to become a disciple, we talked about John four. Read it, meditate on it. It is a great, um, a great thing, a uh, great passage on what to do. What is our job as sowers of the word? To sow, like that's our job. It's to sow, to sow everywhere, to sow to everyone. Um, and the steps of, of what are the steps of belief that we talked about, there is a God, the Bible is an inspired word to us. I am a sinner, Jesus is the Savior I need, I will devote my life to him. Uh, this is what, I, this isn't Bible or scriptural, but this is kind of what I've seen people, the things that people have to believe in to get to, 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 the, to the next step. And then there are three areas of faith um, that people have to um, have to have faith. Uh, one's conviction of mind that they believe in God. They're intellectually, they understand what God wants of them. 
trust of their heart. They trust God. Um, a hundred, uh, they trust God with their soul. They trust Him. They they trust that He is good and a good Father. And surrender will. I'm going to surrender my life to Him. Um, and when we talked about religious investment, um, how small group studies can be um, good, and then some just general principles when talking to prospects. We talked about this last time, um, but you know, emphasizing listening, emphasizing asking questions, um, emphasizing really showing. God um, working through us. Um, and then maybe some thought questions for the end. Uh, you can answer this for yourself. Really think about it. What have you learned from this class? Do you care for the lost? Do the actions in your life show that you care for the lost? What changes will you make in your life? I really appreciate your thoughts and your comments. They've been really, really good. And I hope that this isn't just something that was really cool and you'll go through the rest of your life without making any changes. Uh, I know I need to make changes. And um, I, I'm sure that in, uh, no matter how evangelistic you were beforehand, there are some changes that you can make to be better. And I hope that you will make those changes because the lost of this world depend on it. Um, the, the people in your communities, the people that you come in contact with, you could be the person that helps them um, get connected to God. And so um, just do whatever you can to make those changes in your life. So I appreciate it. Um, and we'll move on to kind of how to teach. Uh, I, there's a couple of lessons that I usually do. One's an overview of the Bible. One is the Ecclesiastes uh, um, um, uh, lesson. And then we'll kind of go through the book of Mark and show how I would teach that to a non-Christian. So I appreciate you and um, I appreciate your, your questions and your comments.